Well, if we've never been introduced, my name is Nate, one of the pastors here. I have the privilege and the honor of bringing you God's word this morning. Open your Bibles up to 2 Samuel. That's right, Old Testament. First couple books of the Bible, if you're new to the Bible. 2 Samuel, right after 1 Samuel, chapter 9. The title of today's message is, At the Table. At the Table. As you're turning there, I do have some study notes on our Anthem Chapel app. You can find those and uh, follow along. If you are a student here, college or high school, come follow me. Come find me after the service with your filled out notes, and I'll give, uh, you will receive some sort of prize. If you're uh, not a student, just a general person, your prize is in heaven. <laughs> but we do believe that God has. We love saying this. We love to remind ourselves the reason why we're here is to proclaim the name of Jesus. That all would look to him and be saved. Our desire as a faith family is to learn how we can uh, love and live just like Jesus. That's why we're here today. That's why we worship. That's why we open up God's word. We believe we don't have to be here. We get to be here. So looking forward to spending some time with you. Let's read uh, a few verses here. About 13 verses. It's an account in the life of David. And I believe it's going to speak to us this morning. 2 Samuel chapter 9, verse 1. I'm reading out the ESV version. And David said, this is David, this is King David, this is David who killed Goliath. And David said, is there still anyone left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba. And they called him to David. And the king said to him, are you Ziba? He said, I'm your servant. Verse 3, the king said, is there not still someone of the house of Saul that I may show kindness to God, a kindness of God to him? Ziba said to the king, there is still a son of Jonathan. He's crippled in his feet. The king said to him, well, where is he? And Ziba said to the king, he's in the house of Maker, the son of Amiel, at Lodabar. Say Lodabar. This sounds like a place I don't want to go to. Then King David sent and brought him from the house of Maker, the son of Amiel, at Lodabar. And Mephibosheth, now we're going to say this name multiple times this morning. It's very hard to say. I'm probably going to mess up a few times. But it's Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, son of Saul, came to David, fell on his face, and paid homage. And David said, Mephibosheth. He answered, Behold, I'm your servant. And David said to him, Do not fear. I will show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. And I will restore to you all the land of Saul, your father, and you shall eat at my table always. And he paid homage and said, What is your servant that you should show regard for a dead dog such as I? Verse 9. And the king called Ziba, Saul's servant, said to him, All that belong to Saul, this would be King Saul, all that belong to King Saul, and all his house I've given to your master's grandson. And you and your sons and your servants shall till the land for him and shall bring him uh, in the produce that your master's grandson may have bread to eat. But Mephibosheth, your master's grandson, shall always eat at my table. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. And Ziba said to the king, according to all that my lord the king commands to his servants, so will your servant do. And so Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. And Mephibosheth, had a, he had a son whose name was Micah. And all who lived in Ziba's house became Mephibosheth's servants. And so Mephibosheth, he lived in Jerusalem, and he ate always at the king's table. Now he was lame in both his feet. This is God's word for us this morning. Would you join us, join me as we pray over our time? And maybe if you would, as we pray, would you mind just having your hands kind of cupped like this as we pray? Oh, Father, here, here we are this morning, and, and I believe many of us are carrying this morning heavy burdens in our hands. Maybe carrying some anxiousness as we look toward Thanksgiving and family. Maybe some of us here are carrying shame or fear. 
Lord, there's many of us here, we, we've got a burden that we're holding in our hands. Let's just, let's just turn our hands over. But right now, Lord, collectively, we're placing them at your feet. We're placing our burden, our fear, our worry, our anxiousness, we're placing it at your feet, where it belongs. We release it, Lord. Let's turn our hands back over. And so now, Lord, in a, in a sense, our hands are empty. Ready to receive from you what you would have for us this morning. We're surrendered. We've submitted to you. We've let go. We've released. And so now we're ready to receive from you. Would you speak? Would you move? Oh, for our good and for your glory. In Jesus' name, all God's people said, amen. Amen. Now we're ready. We're ready now. We're ready. At the table. At the table. I was thinking about this. We've just finished the book of Ephesians. And we've got a little bit of time. We're thinking about we've got Christmas coming up. We've got January around the corner. So we're kind of praying about what to do next as far as a series for us as a church. But So we'll have a few kind of uh, one-off messages, if you will, here. So it's a little bit of a one-off. But thinking about Thanksgiving, thinking about a lot of us sitting at a table come this week. Maybe across from some siblings or relatives or cousins and uncles and at a table, you'll be feasting, hopefully, on some great food and fellowship. And maybe you're looking forward to being at the table. Maybe you're not looking forward to being at the table. Whatever it is, uh, I believe God has a word for us uh, today. Interesting account of David and Saul's grandson, Jonathan's son, Mephibosheth. And we're going to look at just a couple, couple thoughts here for us this morning. Uh, number one, I want you to observe the question. The question. Now look at verse 1, if you will, again, of 2 Samuel chapter 9. The question. And David said, Is there still anyone left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now look at the text there. David and David said, and David said, now for us to kind of just remember a little bit of what's happened, uh, maybe you're new to Christianity or new to the Bible. Sometimes we jump in thinking that you, everyone knows, but David is, uh, he's a king at this moment. It's been a long, hard journey for David. He began as a shepherd boy. And then began, he, he became anointed to be the next king, but through much turmoil and war and conflict and, and abandonment, um, he finally, in chapter 9 here, he's finally the king. Saul, who was the king before him, has been killed. Saul is dead. Saul's son, Jonathan, the best friend of David, is also dead. And we read in chapter 3 of 2 Samuel that it wasn't immediately after that moment that David became king. A long, a lot of war, a lot of battle, a lot of bloodshed. And it seems to be that the house of Saul, the lineage of the, all the sons of Saul, grew weaker and weaker. And the house of David grew stronger and stronger. This is David after Goliath. This is David after he's brought in the Ark of the Covenant. This is David now. His kingdom is established. His enemies are destroyed. The sound of battle has faded, if you will. And what I want you to notice is the heart of David here. The heart of David. David said, is there still anyone left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness? May I show him kindness? When we think about a display of courage in the life of David, we think about David and Goliath, right? Courage. Young David. Approaching Goliath with a sling and a stone. When we think about a display of devotion in the life of David, maybe you might think of earlier on when David brings in the Ark of the Covenant, this symbol of God's glory. And David is so excited, every six steps they're sacrificing uh, animals to, to God. 
And David, we see him, we just, he's described as just dancing before the Lord. He's so excited to bring the ark, the presence of God, into the city of Jerusalem. When we think about a display of kindness, chapter 9 of 2 Samuel is it's unparalleled. This really is David at his best. Typically, when a king comes on the throne, the question he asks is, not how can I show kindness, but how can I eliminate my enemies? The first part of the question makes sense. Is there not still someone at the house of Saul? Saul was the king before him. The first part of the question makes sense. David's probably thinking, i got to get rid of the bloodline of Saul so I can establish my bloodline and my kingdom. I want to eliminate the threat. I don't want anyone to usurp the throne. So the first part of this question makes sense. Is there still anyone out there of the house of Saul? We might understand this. We understand about eliminating the enemy. I was talking to my good friends over there. they got termites in their house. And they're not trying to show kindness to the termites. They're trying to destroy those little buddy, buddies, buggy, bugger, bugs, whatever they are. Bad, bad things. You might remember when I was infested, my home was infested with rats. I was not trying to show kindness to them. I wanted to kill every last one of those things. And I did as well. <laughs> but notice the second part of this question. Who's left of the house of Saul that, what's it say, that I can show kindness to him? I can show kindness. And, and it's, even, it's more than just David wanting to be nice. It's more, look, look at verse 3. Verse 3 says this. He repeats himself. And the king said, is there still not someone of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God to him? The kindness of God. The word there in, in the Hebrew is the word hased. Hased. And you might have heard that word before. Maybe you haven't. But it's hased is a Hebrew word that is trying to put all the characteristics of God into like one phrase. Hased. It's the idea of loyal love. It's the idea of covenant love. It's the idea of steadfast love, compassion, faithfulness. Hased, hased is not merely an emotion or feeling, but involves action on behalf of someone who's in need. Hased describes a, a sense of love and loyalty that inspires mercy and compassionate behavior. This word hased, this word kindness of God we see, the hased, is like 250 times in the Old Testament. It reveals an essential quality of God's character. When God appears to Moses, remember that in Exodus like 34, you know, the Lord passes before Moses and says what? He says, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and what? Abounding in steadfast love. That word steadfast love is the word hased. God's saying, I am full of this covenant love. I'm abounding in faithfulness, steadfast in love. The message of the gospel, of course, is God's act of forgiveness and salvation in Jesus. It's rooted in this idea of hased. Hased, God's love, his covenant love, his faithful love, his steadfast love for you and for me. That's what we're talking about here. This is why I think, again, this is David at his best here. He's wanting to show Hased to the son of Jonathan. Covenant love. This is why I think, you know, many, many times, right, David's called a man after God's own heart. That's God's heart is to show Hased to you. Faithful love to you. Covenant love to you. Loyal love to you. Now, I want you to notice the helplessness. We see the heart of David. Notice the helplessness of Mephibosheth. Look at verse 3 again. The king says, listen, is there still not someone that I can show this has said, this covenant love? Like, I want to be kind. I want to be gracious to someone. And the Ziba said to the king, well, there's still a son of Jonathan left, but he's crippled in his feet. Interesting that Ziba, the servant, would know this fact about Mephibosheth. He's crippled in his feet. And for us to know the story, we can go back to chapter 4 of 2 Samuel. And what happens is Mephibosheth is five years old. He's the son of Jonathan. His caretaker hears the news of the battle where Saul and Jonathan are killed. Saul and Jonathan are killed. The caretaker hears the news. 
And typically, who's the next king is going to kill anyone in the bloodline? So the caretaker is like freaking out. We've got to get out of the kingdom here. And she picks up Mephibosheth, five-year-old, and she runs away, runs to escape. But in her running, she drops Mephibosheth, we read. And he becomes crippled in his feet. And we don't know exactly, maybe, he break, he, maybe both of his feet break and they never heal correctly, but he is basically crippled. He is lame would be the word, not able to walk, not able to care for himself. He never recovers. Now notice where the home of Mephibosheth is. Many years have passed. Most would say now he's 20 years old. And Ziba says what? The king, verse 4 says, the king said, so where is this? Where is he now? Where is he now? And Ziba says, well, he's in the house of Maker, the son of Amiel, and he's at Lodabar. He's at Lodabar. So when he flees, the caretaker takes him somewhere, and now he's living in a place called Lodabar. Now, the reason why I make an instance of this is because Lodabar, the name means a place of no pasture. It could also mean a place of no communication. Like, if you've ever gone dirt biking and you want to go to Mojave Desert and you're on, like, Pier Blossom Highway and you're looking around thinking, there ain't nothing here. And you're seeing, like, a little bit of a, like, California city. Like, you're thinking, who lives in California City, man? What's, what's going on here? That's the idea. It's like, it's low to bar, man. No pasture. Nothing going on here. No communication. Now, I, I want to just pause and maybe you can begin to see why we're thinking about that this morning, this, this story, this account. Maybe can you begin to see yourself in this story a little bit? Does not the Bible tell me and you that we have all what? Fallen short of the glory of God. The God who is holy and righteous and perfect. He has a standard. And on account of our sin, and uh, we've been separated, right? Separated. In a sense, we're in living in Lodabar. Shame and regret. But because of God's grace, his has said love for us, right? His faithful love toward us, right? God would demonstrate his love for us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, right? For our sake he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God. So we'll see this play out a little bit later in our, our, our message this morning. The question. Secondly, I want you to look at the action. The action. So look at King, uh, verse 5. So King David sent and brought him from the house of the maker, the son of Amiel, at Lodabar. And Mephibosheth, that's his name. We know he's like 20 years old maybe now. The son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David and he fell on his face and he paid homage. And David said, Mephibosheth. And he answered, Behold, I am your servant. Notice the request. The request. The King David in verse 5 says, Okay, I'm hearing about this guy, this young man named Mephibosheth. He's crippled in his feet. He was dropped when he was five. He's living in Lodabar, a place of no pasture, Mojave Desert. So what does the king do? Verse 5 says, Look at the request. The King David sent and brought him. Go get him. Go get that guy. And I just thought, you know, love, love always takes the initiative here, you know. As I think about Christmas, we're coming into Christmas season, right? That's when we celebrate the fact that Jesus decided to descend. He decided to leave heaven and come to earth. He took the initiative. Here's a king. The king saying, go, go get that guy. Go get him. Go get him. Here's a principle for us this morning. And God's grace finds us even when we're not looking for it. God's grace finds us even when we're not looking out for it. Matthew, we read in the New Testament, is just minding his own business at the tax table. And Jesus, personified grace, walks up to Matthew and says, Hey, you come, you come follow me. And Zacchaeus was just sitting in a tree. And grace, Jesus walks up to him and says, hey, I'm going to your house today. A woman is just looking for some water. She's thirsty, goes to the well. Jesus encounters her. She wasn't looking for grace. Encounters her and changes her life forever. I just think about this idea. God knows where you're at right now. You might be living in Lodabar. 
a place of no pasture, a place of shame and regret and fear and anxiousness. And maybe you have been, in a sense, abandoned and betrayed, discarded. But God has not forgotten you. And grace, God's grace, finds you when you're not even looking for it. He's not forgotten you. Maybe today is the time to pack your bags and leave Lodabar. Now, can you imagine Mephibosheth? Place yourself in Mephibosheth's place. That's hard to say. Place yourself in Mephibosheth's shoes. Here's a knock at the door. Is Mephibosheth there? The king wants to see you. Now, what's going through his mind? <laughs> he finally found me. I, my bloodline is part of the other kingdom. And I've been hiding in Lodabar for about 15 years, and, and now the king is coming to get me. Can you imagine the trepidation and the fear and the anxiousness? Feeble chef, your, your presence is requested at the king's house. I mean, can, 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 you just, can you just imagine? What's he thinking? So we read in verse, verse 7, though. He, he comes. We read early. He's coming. He's humble. He's afraid, right? Because verse 7 says, and David said to him, do not fear, which means he was probably afraid. I don't know how he gets there. I'm not who, if he was carried in, was he on crutches? But he gets to the presence of the king. And he's unsure what's going to happen. What's the action going to be taken? And David says, do not fear. I will show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. Whew. And I'm going to restore you all the land of Saul, your father, your grandfather. And you shall eat at my table always. Do not fear. Right? Because he's freaking out. I'm going to show you kindness. I'm going to show you hesed, loyal love, covenant love. I'm going to restore everything to you, Mephibosheth. Everything. I'm restoring it all to you today. Now notice the reason, the reason why David does this. Look what it says. Watch the text. Don't fear. I will show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan, Mephibosheth. This day is happening not because of who you are, but because of who your daddy was. And your dad and I were best friends, Jonathan and I. We were, we were great friends. In fact, that's a study all on its own, the friendship of David and Jonathan. We actually did that at our, at our men's retreat. I had opportunity to share that. That, that. that friendship was a great friendship. And we read that David and Jonathan made a covenant to each other. Because Jonathan knew he was not going to be the king. David was going to be the king. So Jonathan says, David, when you become the king, can you show kindness to my offspring? And David said, you bet I will. I will. So here's David, said, loyal love. Not having an unfulfilled promise, but fulfilling a promise. For the sake of your father, I'm going to restore everything back to you, Mephibosheth. So not only does God's grace find us when we're not even looking for it. God's grace forgives us on the account of someone else. Mephibosheth is getting restored everything, not because of who he is, but because of who his daddy was. Isn't that the same thing for me and you? That we have fallen short of the glory of God, that sin has stained us? But because we placed our faith in Jesus, Jesus in our place, Jesus in my place, that upon the cross God would treat his son as though he had lived my sin-stained life? That in exchange, in exchange, I would be treated as though I had lived Christ's sinless life. I'm receiving grace on the account of someone else. I'm receiving forgiveness on the account of someone else. That's what Christianity is all about. That's why we're so thankful. We're so blessed. We're like, wow, God, you would do that for me? I deserve wrath. I deserve hell. And yet because of what Jesus did for me, you treat me like one of your sons? Whew, so powerful. Jesus in my place. Look at the response, verse 8. And so Mephibosheth is just like blown away. He says, what is your servant that you should show this kind of regard? I'm just a dead dog. You know, like dogs were not like, you know, your cute little labradoodle kind of situation, right? Dogs in that time were despised. What was worse than a dog was a dead dog. 
So Mephibosheth is like, like, I'm just a dead dog. Like, why show me this kind of love? He's stunned. He's shocked. What he expected, he didn't receive. What he received, he didn't deserve. And it just floors him. Right? Listen, humility is always the correct response to God's grace. Amen? Grace is always received in humility. What does God say? God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. And so Mephibosheth is in the house of the king. Grace has found him out when he wasn't looking. Grace has forgiven him on behalf of someone else. And lastly, let's think about this idea of provision. Provision. Verse 9 and verse 11. So the king said to Ziba, Saul's servant, said to him, Listen, all that belonged to Saul and to all his house I have given to your master's grandson. Mephibosheth now is in charge. And you and your sons and your servants, they shall till the land for him. And you're going to bring the produce to this guy that your master's grandson may have bread to eat. But just in case that's not enough, Mephibosheth, your master's grandson shall always eat at my table. And Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Look at the inheritance, the inheritance here. Mephibosheth went from having no home, living in Lodabar, to having King Saul's land, his grandfather's estate. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine just in a moment receiving this inheritance? This property, not only the property, but the people to actually work the property. Again, this is, this is David at his best. Which is interesting because in like two chapters, we see David at his worst. In chapter 11 with Bathsheba. But here, David is just exemplifying the love of our Heavenly Father. Inheritance. This is a kingdom of kindness here. Not only an inheritance is provided for him. But a new identity, a new identity. Look at the text. And so Mephibosheth, last part there, ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. Whew. What a line that is. He was a dead dog earlier, but now he's a son of the king. What, what kind of love is this? I'm thinking about 1 John chapter 3, verse 1 says, See what kind of love the Father has given to us? That we should be called children of God, and so we are. That's the God we serve. Right? God's grace doesn't just find us when we're not looking for it. God's grace doesn't just forgive us on account of someone else. But God's grace causes us to flourish, to flourish. Look at verse 12. Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah, and all who lived in Ziba's house became Mephibosheth's servants. And Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem, and he always ate at the king's table. Now he was lame in both his feet. Now, this stumped me as I was studying. Why does the writer remind us that he was lame in both his feet? Because we already heard about that earlier. Why in this beautiful account, beautiful account of grace and love and restoration, by saying, and by the way, remember he was lame in both his feet. So I'm thinking, what's going on here? What's going on here? Well, let's just think about it for just a little bit. Now, I am no Hebrew scholar like my brother over there, Randy, but I do a little bit of searching. And if you remember, earlier in verse 3, verse 3, when Ziba is describing Mephibosheth's lameness, his, his sickness, he says, there's still a son of Jonathan, but he's crippled in his feet. He's crippled in his feet. The word there for crippled... It has, it's, it's only mentioned twice in the Old Testament. And it's right here in 2 Samuel 9. It's also in Isaiah 66. The same word is used to describe someone that has a broken heart. A broken spirit. Remember, a, a contrite heart the Lord doesn't despise. So he's talking about a contriteness, brokenness. So earlier, Mephibosheth is described as not only being lame and crippled in his feet, but he's crippled in, in the inside of him. The shame and, and just weight and brokenness in his life. But now, now, after encountering the grace of the king, in verse 13 it says he was lame. He was lame in his feet. 
The word there, only mentioned right there, it means, it just means lame. It only means his physical ailment. In other words, his feet still didn't work, but he was at the king's table now. His story is, is no longer about what was taken from him, but what was given to him. He has a new identity. I, I'm at the king's table. Yeah, I, I still have a, a story. I, I have been through a few things. I, I have been dropped. I was abandoned. I have been sinned against. My, my, my parents did get a divorce, and I did bounce from house to house to house. And I was betrayed by a very close friend. And I did get laid off from a company that I invested my heart and soul into. And I did have a spouse that told me they were going to love me till death do us part. But that didn't happen. And I did have a close family member that I should have trusted, but inappropriately did things to me. I have been dropped. And I do have a story. My past can describe me, but it does not define me. I'm at the king's table. And when Mephibosheth gets carried in, or he's on crutches, when he is situated at the table, the king's table covers over his lameness. The king's table covers over his crippledness. The king's table covers, covers. Is that your story? I know it's mine. At the king's table, I have a new identity. No longer, am I, no longer am I an outcast living in Lodopar. I'm at the king's table. I'm treated as one of his sons. What, what a beautiful picture this is for us to think about coming into Thanksgiving. I think about Song of Solomon, right? 2 verse 4. He brought me to the banqueting table, and his banner over me is love. What a great picture. A table. When we're sitting at the king's table, we're all on equal footing. The table of the king covers over all our lameness, all our crippleness. Grace, God's grace finds us when we're not even looking for it. God's grace forgives us on account of someone else. And God's grace causes us to flourish at the king's table, a new identity. As we come to a close this morning and the worship team comes back up, I, I, I wonder how the Lord spoke to you today. Maybe you are here today and you find yourself living in Lodabar, Lodabar, a place of no pasture, a place of shame and regret. I want to just invite you to pack your bags and leave and come to the table of the king. And maybe today you've never placed saving faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Today could be your day today. Uh, maybe you're here and just this story, it's an incredible account. It's just, it's just kind of hitting you hard. And, and maybe you identify really almost too closely to Mephibosheth. Maybe there's things and hurts and hang-ups in your life that were caused by someone else. And the way, the, the, the place you're in today is because someone else did something. And I would just invite you, as we did this morning, to turn that over to God. Turn that over to God. Your past, that is your story. That describes you. But it doesn't need to define who you are. You're a child of the king. Come sit at his table today. Dine with him. Fellowship with him. Let him cover, pour over you compassion and tenderness and has said love over you. Father, we, we thank you for this moment. We thank you for this incredible story of grace, of forgiveness, of tenderness, 
an account of someone that was isolated but brought into family. Someone that felt like rejected and an outcast but brought in to intimacy. And Lord, I believe that's, that's your desire for all of us. You place the lonely in families. Father, maybe there's someone here this morning that just feels like that, living in Lodabar all by themselves, no pasture, no communication. I, I pray today they'd take the invitation. They'd, they'd hear the knock at the door. The king request your presence. Yeah. We thank you for your word that although we're reading about an historical account that happened so many years ago, it speaks to our hearts this morning, right here, November 20th, 2022. We believe your word is not just a fairy tale, it's not just some stories wrapped together. It's living, it's a breathing, it speaks, it corrects, it encourages, it rebukes. So we thank you for this opportunity we've had. Hmm. And in this moment, as every head is bowed and eyes closed, maybe you're here today and maybe you were invited, maybe your roommate, roommate brought you or your parents brought you or your spouse dragged you. In this holy moment, as every head is bowed and eye is closed, maybe today for the first time you recognize what God has done for you, that he would send his son to die in your place, that your sin, the things you said and did and thought that displeased God were stacked up and they separate you from, from a holy God. But Jesus would come and take that upon himself and die in your place, offering you forgiveness and purpose, peace, and a place at the king's table. So that's you. You want to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. I want to lead you in a prayer this morning. Uh, the prayer is not something magical, but it's a way to recognize and identify with what's going on. And so if that's you here today for the first time wanting to place faith in Jesus, repeat this prayer after me. Dear Jesus, I come to you, a sinner in need of a Savior. I thank you today for dying on the cross for me for rising again and giving me life. I repent from my sin. I turn away from my old way of living and turn towards you. I receive this new life in you, Jesus. Make me a new creation. I want to feast at the king's table. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. If that was you here this morning and for the first time place saving faith in Jesus today, we'd love to get to know you, love to pray over you, love to encourage you, love to come along, alongside of you, wrap our arms around you, get to know you. If that was you, be sure to stand up and come forward and meet the prayer team or meet myself. We'd love to encourage you on your walk. Would you all just stand with me this morning? The prayer team's going to come forward. We'll have some prayer members in the front. We'll have a few prayer members in the back corners as well. Love to have a chance to respond. Not sure what the Lord's spoken to you or how he wants you to, to, to respond this morning, but I do believe there's lots of reasons to rejoice, lots of reasons to pray. Let's do that. Let's do that now. The prayer team is here. Let's respond.